Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, being trapped uh, at a crossroads in life doesn't always have to be a political or a social statement. Sometimes it's just a fact of life. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brain uh, on current projects, state of the industry, uh, how they got started, and so very much more, in a light and conversational way, because that's just how we like to do it over here. Uh, and if you like how we do it over here, uh, you can subscribe to our podcast. And I mean, we hope that you would like to, because you're listening to us right now. You can do that wherever you need to find your podcasts. Amazon, Google, Apple, Spotify, and plus you can find every single one of our episodes archived over at our YouTube channel at In The Seats. Also, we would really appreciate it if you would follow us on social media. Uh, you can do that over at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for all sorts of updates. And finally, and I dare say most importantly, would you do us the kindness of visiting us over at In The Seats, in the seats.ca for all the latest and greatest movie news, reviews, and all sorts of fun stuff from the lands of VOD, from festivals, from anything to have to do with the moving image that we can possibly think of, because that's just how we roll over there, and uh, we would love to see you, and uh, I know our guys love to have our stuff seen, so that's just, again, that's uh, that's how we do it. And uh, I guess that kind of dovetails into this episode, because we're going to talk about a movie that uh, really deserves to be seen. It uh, had its premiere at Inside Out last year. Uh, and it is hitting VO, all VOD platforms tomorrow. And it is called Jump Darling. About a rookie drag queen who uh, breaks up with his boyfriend and uh, escapes to the country. Uh, where he finds his grandmother really in a, in a sharp sort of physical and mental decline. But who really wants to avoid the nursing home. And they're both at this interesting crossroads in their lives. And it makes for a really dynamic pairing, and uh, it's 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 a movie about sort of having to come to grips with sort of being at the the a crossroads in your life, and I mean those are I mean we all hit them from time to time, and they're not the easiest things to navigate. And I think this is a beautiful little movie that deserves to be seen. Uh, and we got the unique pleasure to sit down with writer director Phil Collin, uh, Col- Connell, excuse me. Blah, blah, uh, who came up with the story and uh, just how he found uh, his fantastic lead in Thomas Duplessis and working with the iconic Clor- Cloris Leachman in one of her final roles. And uh, we had a great talk about the movie and uh, a little bit about Cloris Leachman and just sort of the importance of a, of a story like this being uh, as universal as humanly possible and that's what this film is it's a it's a fantastic film and it it is one that uh, really needs some audiences so if uh, when it drops tomorrow on VOD if you need something to watch I do recommend giving this a try because it is a fantastic film and I hope you enjoy our talk with Phil because I certainly know that I did well I mean no obviously I mean first off just congratulations on the film and I really really enjoyed it I mean walk me through I guess I guess maybe the inspiration for the story. And I mean, I guess particularly sort of the drag elements of it, because I, I not just sort of the drag culture, but I mean, I guess almost the, the borderline discrimination inside the gay community of drag culture. That's the thing that really kind of caught my eye. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the, the inspiration in general was, you know, the, the kind of top line thing was, you know, I wanted to make, uh, you know, sort of a family drama as my first feature. And at the time that I was writing it, there was, you know, I was uh, kind of going through early end of life conversations with my my grandmother. And so that kind of formed one basis of it. But I was also um, kind of I, I, I've been in and out of, you know, filmmaking over the course of my adult life. And I was kind of recommitting myself uh, to that work uh, at the time, obviously, and started writing this feature. I just finished a couple shorts and I was kind of. Um, you know, just kind of wrestling with some of the issues related to the vulnerability associated with, you know, making creative work that you were also writing and putting yourself into it, uh, into it. And, um, you know, so I was, you know, really interested in kind of exploring the idea of choosing life as an artist. And, 
but I, but I wasn't interested in doing that from an autobiographical point of view. So I kind of was like, okay, well, what's, you know, kind of a light bulb went off about, you know, some of the things where, you know, this idea of choosing life as a queer artist, which, you know, just comes with its own issues. And I just sort of thought, you know, at some point along the way, drag seemed like a really excellent way to explore that in a very dynamic way, um, because drag is sort of this ultimate, you know, expression of queer artistry, and it has its own dynamics. And, you know, in, once I started going down that path and interviewing uh, folks from the drag community who I was close with, close with and kind of testing some of the ideas of the story out, um, you know, one of the things that really just started to pop out very clearly um, was just, um, you know, was this, this idea of assimilation versus, you know, being sort of a, a heteronormative, assimilating gay person versus a kind of, um, on, you know, a champion of queer culture kind of gay person. Mm. And those kind of, you know, those intra gay politics as it were, um, you know, which I thought was, you know, just an interesting element to get away from, you know, any notion of a coming out story. You know, if this was going to be a story about, um, you know, if there's going to be a queer element to the story and dealing with shame and all of those kinds of things that are often in, in queer stories, like well, what's a kind of a new dimension there. And it's like, well, actually the sort of intra gay shame, you know, kind of the, um, the shaming of the gays who don't assimilate or, um, you know, I've found comfort in being a gay person, but I'm still working on Bay Street as a lawyer and, you know, I can play, you know, very comfortably in the straight world and that's the way I like it versus, um, you know, being a champion for kind of queer issues. This film really felt like it, 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 it exists in its environment. And I mean, it's, it feels like Prince Edward County was like the perfect place to actually make something like this because it feels like it's that one spot sort of in our sort of universe that where this would make sense. And I mean, I'm kind of curious what drew you to there, not only to shoot, but to sort of acknowledge that where you were shooting is kind of where it was, even though you didn't necessarily weren't talking about town specifically. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, so it was, uh, again, it kind of came back to um, my grandmother bought a, a place in Prince Edward County in 1999, and she was a big inspiration in, in sketching out the character of Margaret played by Cor Cloris Leachman. Um, and at, and, and at some point, you know, so I was used to visiting her in a small town. And so that was very much the dynamic of my relationship with my grandmother. So it just felt like a good way to sketch out that the city versus country aspects of things, right. especially when you add the, the drag element and the drag on the strip element and how that, you know, is so, you know, like Prince Edward County, you know, wine country is kind of like very polar like opposite of that so like the duality of sometimes existing as a gay person is sure. interesting to me kind of like you know family dinners and you know eating chicken around a family dinner and then going out to the gay bar and like watching you know a drag queen <laughs> perform is you know part of being you know in many it was part of my gay experience anyway so um there was that but I was also just familiar with it because I had been visiting my grandmother there and at some point I uh, and I've been going there for the last 20 years. So I, you know, um, spending summers there. So I just thought I could, you know, I could, I could make it work with the story. And I also had my own particular lens on the place, you know, yeah. that I could, um, that I could bring to it, you know, in terms of my experience and what it looks like through my eyes. Um, you know, uh, it's also, you know, the County is an interesting place in that I've been going there for 20 years, but it kind of has become really hot in the last kind of five to six years um, you know, kind of been really trendy and written up in every, you know, major publication and everything else. And, you know, so that I think there's this kind of image of the county as kind of, you know, this really slick, you know, Drake Devonshire kind of thing. But there's <laughs> there's lots of other pieces to the county. You know, there's real lots of dimensions. So sure. Now, I mean, I love that you brought up Cloris. And I mean, I've got to imagine, I mean, you're writing the script, you come up with the idea. I'm sure you said in the laughable sort of throwaway moment, boy, wouldn't it be great if I could get Cloris Leachman for this? <laughs> How did you actually get Cloris for, for this part? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we we had believed at, at some point along the way, a light bulb went off that I thought I might have a shot at getting a star um, for the role of Margaret, just because it was this really meaty film carrying role. 
And, you know, we just sort of had this notion that, hmm, you know, if you're over the 85 and over the age of 85 and still working, um, you know, maybe you'll take a risk on a, on a debut feature because, you know, you're probably at that point not working for me. You're probably working for the love of the art and you're probably not getting scripts where you get to carry films that often. So maybe we have a shot. Um, so that was kind of the operating principle. And from there, it was just um, writing letters and working with our casting director and doing the Hollywood dance, which is just sort of, um, you know, papering offers with dates to, you know, stars and seeing if they get back to you and then they read it. And, you know, with Chloris, it was, it was, we, we had heard, you know, and seen obviously from her filmography, filmography that she had been known to be indie friendly and she was, you know, she was very much still working and wanted to be working. Um, you know, so once we kind of like clued into Chloris could be perfect for this, it started to just sort of feel right. And, and it, it resonated with her and her team and they, you know, they bit, you know, um, she signed on to the project, I think in around early April, we went to camera that June. So it all happened very fast. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, especially in an ensemble, like in a film like this, like the ensemble has to be right. And I mean, Thomas is really so perfect in the role and, I, I just love the dynamic, not only between him and him and Chloris, but I mean, with, between him and Linda as well. And I mean, there is this sort of, it's it's got a very natural tone. And like you say, it's not, it's not a coming out story. It's not the shock of, oh, he's gay. It's like, he's gay and they don't care. That's fine. You know, can you walk me through just not, not only finding Thomas, but just sort of really trying to find the right balance between the three of them to make sure it all kind of worked as well as it did. Right. Um... Yeah. I, I, so, I mean, the general casting thing, you know, from a casting point of view, it was like, let's cast a, a star in the role of Margaret and we'll, and we'll discover a star in the role of um, Russell. Um, and then we'll kind of bridge the divide with veteran, you know, Canadian talent um, in between. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the like pragmatic technical thing from the, the kind of creative sort of spark that you're talking about. Um, you know, I mean, that's a bit of, that was a bit of the magic dust, I think, you know, like, like we hoped that that would be the case, but we didn't get a chance to put these three actors in a room together, you know, and screen test them, um, together, you know, the, it just worked out, you know, Thomas, um, we saw over 150 people for, for the role of Russell. We did an open call in Canada and, you know, we were really interested in, like I said, discovering somebody new um because we just sort of felt like why not it just seems the right thing to do um you know and he he he's just got this like this sensitivity and this kind of warmth but he also had this darkness like we needed you know all of those things that we looked for in the character of russell and um but and just kind of hoped that the chemistry was there and the chemistry really was there. I mean, you know, like he melts when you talk about Cloris and Linda, he just loved both of them so much. And they, you know, they instantly connected when we introduced Thomas and Cloris on set, we didn't let them meet until we actually, the, the very first scene we shot with them was the scene they meet in the, in the film. And so we actually didn't uh, introduce them until uh, they met in the take of the, the, get the, <laughs> the get the hell out of my house, you prowling son of a bitch moment. And, um, you know, so after we shot that, you know, we kind of let them have a moment, you know, and she's meeting her co-star and she just looked at him and said, you're perfect. You're perfect. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, and then, they, you know, they were just kind of this little pair throughout the whole thing, both on and off screen. They would, you know, they would fool around and, you know, chill out together and they just really, really connected. And, um, and then Linda, you know, she came on set a little bit later in the same way she does in the film. And, you know, came on as a bit of an outsider and, um, you know, but she's a mom and she just had that kind of maternal thing. And, you right. know, and again, you know, Thomas had all this respect and reverence for her. Um, so like, like I say, I kind of, I think, you know, I'd love to say that we did something that made that happen, but like, they just, they just all really gelled together, you know? Well, and I mean, and that's a beautiful thing to hear. Cause I mean, it really does come through on the screen and, I mean, particularly with Thomas, because I mean, there are so many parts of his performance that are that are really kind of brave because I mean, he throws himself into the drag sequences and these drag sequences that you shot look absolutely epic. 
and they really do feel very credible because I mean, in the film, you're also using other drag performers to sort of give it a certain degree of credence. And I mean, walk me through not only sort of getting him to do these drag performances, but to sort of do them properly and really sort of get the swagger of it all down. Right. Right. So, um, I mean, you know, again, it, it really is a credit to Thomas, the performer, you know, like, um, and just kind of jumping in and doing what was required. You know, the credit we can take is just the work we put into the casting process to make sure that, <laughs> you know, he was the right, the right choice. He did have to do in my, I, he said it's two in my memory, it was three that, you know, but, um, full drag performances through the casting process. So we, we actually, you know, he did, you know, his first, his first audition, which was a scene and a drag performance. And then there was another callback, which my memory was another drag performance. His was that it was just scenes. And then in an in-person callback with, um, and in each of those cases, unlike many of the other folks we auditioned, he came with fairly fleshed out, prepared performances um, that, you know, were choreographed to a degree in the same way that he is in the film that kind of felt like he knew exactly what he was doing, but at the same time, there was a rawness and a freedom to it. So it kind of had this mixture of preparation with experimentation and um, which again was exactly what we were looking for. So then th once we cast him and through the process, um, you know, it was, it was my feeling that we were never going to fully choreograph this performance. Like that the, the, the current, well, we, we were, but the choreography was all going to come from Thomas. I was just going to shape the narrative flow of the, of the scenes and sort of say, you know, here, you know, here's how we want the energy to go and here's where you are as a character. And, but at the end of the day, all the actual moves and everything else came from him. We did invite um, like Ty Naomi Banks who appears in the film and has been a huge project for me for years. It's all of, it's all her wigs that, Fishy Falters wears in the film, for example. <laughs> um, she came to a rehearsal or two. Face Lift came to a rehearsal. So he had these drag queens there. We brought them so that they could kind of, um, you know, offer tips and coaching. But again, they were really just there as moral support in many ways. Like ultimately, he put on the pair of heels and just leaned into it. And, you know, if you were to ask him, he would say, you know, once you, once you throw on the heels and you put in the makeup and you get on the outfit, like something takes over and he just kind of leaned into that. Um, yeah. And also credit to our cinematographer who was just Victor Cahoy, who was just, you know, so in it with him whenever we did this stuff, like he just got right into the performance um, and kind of became, you know, Thomas's like, you know, sort of whisper, you know, would just kind of move around him instinctively and, and capture it all honestly. Music clearances must have been a bitch. How do you how do you sort of shortlist the list of songs to sort of get the right ones that you want? Oh my god, yeah. I mean, again, I I was working with my music supervisor Christine Leslie before I even had producers. Like, I started talking to her and saying, "How am I going to make this happen? This is going to be a micro budget, small Canadian film, and I need somewhere between three and six like you know titles. And, and of those six titles, because I've got six drag performance, you know, a bunch of them have to be solidly recognizable tunes and you know how are we going to do that um we didn't have money really so all we had was time and that's just what we did we just worked on it forever you know she this this music supervisor christine leslie has been in this industry for her entire career um and you know has all those relationships with the publishers and you know, just work with me to make it happen. You know, the challenge was that, that you couldn't look at any song in isolation. You know, if, if you know, if, if it was going to be this type of song for this performance, well, you can't really then do this type of song for this performance. Like that's just not going to work. You know, like there was, there was, so, so the, the challenge was that as soon as you took, it was kind of like casting, everything is casting, you know, as soon as you put, one song in here, it sort of says something about the musical treatment you're going for and the style of the film you're making. Um, so that was what really made it hard is, um, you know, wanting to pick things that worked, but also worked together and then also worked for the story of the scene. Um, so it was a lot of like stop and go and stop and go. And, um, but yeah, and then leaning on making, making sure we were leaning on, um, you know, iconic kind of queer artists, leaning on CanCon when we could, 
you know, we've got the hidden cameras. We got Carol yeah. Pope and Rough Trade. We've got um, Cave, which is this new Montreal band. You know, we've got Ali X. We've got, you know, so doing as much of that as we could too. And, and trying to avoid drag cliches, you know, um, trying to not just do, you know, an, an easily clearable Whitney Houston song or an easily right. clearable right. Tina Turner song, you know. Um, so I don't know if that totally answers your question, but it was very, very hard work. <laughs> no yeah no because i mean that's the one thing that fascinated me because i mean especially as i was watching the performances i was like i know that song shit i know that song i'm like oh my god this is a canadian movie with no money how did they clear all these songs <laughs> well in many cases too what we had to do was you know in the case of robin um you know we uh, she clears all her own music right. um you know you know she's got big publishers or whatever but she personally approves everything so you know um in her case and a few others they had to write a letter you know and describing exactly how we were going to use the song why it was important for the story why it was you know right it would work narratively in a scene why it would honor her work um you know and so thankfully that resonated i mean i think so much of the Robin performance is like very also honors Robin, the artist as well, you know, like the, you know, just even the outfit and the rawness of it all is very her. And so, you know, I, fe I you know, that felt like there was some symbiosis that hopefully resonated to her with her when she read the letter and she let us use it, you know? No, for sure. Um, and I mean, I think that's, I think that's the magic of the movie because there's this element of it. That's that, I mean, well, I mean, yes. I mean, I'm a, I'm a straight white guy, so I can't I can't talk to the gay experience. But there is so much of the film that sort of transcends any sort of gender or specificity because it's about this guy trapped between two worlds, and not sort of knowing where to go, and sort of the the complex struggle of all that, and it it really allows it to be this very kind of universal thing which i think is probably the important thing because i mean especially at the end of the day it's important to understand that we all have those struggles that no matter what we're all going to be stuck between two worlds no matter you know what our preferences are in life yeah absolutely and that, i mean that's very kind of you to say because that's obviously what we were you know hoping for that you always hope for, you know, you tell us, you tell a very specific story and hope it has like some kind of universal resonance, you know, that it connects with people that don't necessarily have this particular experience, but, um, but they can find themselves in it. And um, I agree with you. I mean, I think we all, we all, these are both just characters at kind of major turning points in their lives um, and wrestling with those in the context of family, you know, and, um, you know, and kind of, not even dealing with those struggles directly with each other, but they're dealing with them, you know, in parallel with each other and with the sport of one another. And, you know, um, but, but those particular, the particulars of, of their choices and their struggles are not, like you said, are, are just not, um, uh, you know, are, are, are very, you know, are very, are very connected to most people's experiences. We all have major turning points. Um, yeah. So thank you. Now, I mean, this is the this is the tough question, but did Cloris did Cloris get to see sort of any of her work before before she left? She did, yeah. So we um, so we actually screened the film for you know. So we we first screened the film publicly at Inside Out in October at the drive-in. Mm -hmm. They gave us a this amazing drive-in um, sort of unveiling, which was you know the closest thing you could get to an in-person screening right. during the pandemic you yeah. know which was which was really really quite amazing and they were so generous to give us that treatment they've been a huge partner both all the way through the financing of this film to the to the premiering of it um before we did that um about a couple weeks before we did that we unveiled the film to um thomas and chloris so we had this little private screening for thomas and a few of the key people in the production just so he wasn't seeing it for the first time at the drive-in and he right. would have, have a chance to kind of digest the film because obviously it's such an important film for him as an actor. Um, and when we did that, we sent a link to Cloris and Dinah, her daughter, who was also with her on set um, when we shot uh, unbeknownst to Thomas. And then we arranged a FaceTime after the screening. <laughs> um, and um, so we did, so she did see it and we did get to talk to her and um you know, she just kind of cracked. She sort of said, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was lovely. I loved it. Um, I look so old, <laughs> you know, 
um, which is, you know, which is funny because it's the exact same thing, obviously, you know, my grandmother would have said, um, but, you know, Thomas was just overjoyed to see her, you know, as soon as the phone rang after the screening. Um, so yeah, we're, we're thrilled. Obviously we were, you know, one of the saddest things about the whole thing is that, you know, we have, we still haven't been able to celebrate with all the people who've made the film in person. I mean, the, the driving was the closest thing, but to actually literally get together with all the creatives and people behind this thing. Cause a lot of them haven't even met each other. Um, we haven't had a chance to do that, but to not have a chance to be in an, uh, with an audience, you know, we always imagined that, you know, we'd be with an audience and we'd fly Cloris up and she would, you know, see the thing and then, you know, be invited on stage after, and you know, the place would just go nuts um, because we're just so proud of her performance in this, but also because of who she is and, and you know, what her life has been about. So it's, it's, it's sad for us that we haven't, you know, we didn't get that, but we did, we know that she saw it and we know that she got a chance to at least have us appreciate her you know, uh, in that kind of little FaceTime moment, you know? Do you think in hindsight, she might've known this was her last one? Because I mean, if you look back, even with a whole bunch of series of different actors in their last performances, we are all, we, we've gotten a lot of very sort of bittersweet, but very sort of poignant and very sort of real and tender performances like Cloris gave here. I mean, I'm kind of curious from your perspective, do you think she knew that this might be the one? You know, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I have no idea. Um, you know, it, it, it came up a couple of times, not with her. People would say that to me um, and maybe to each other, you know, when we were shooting or after shooting. And I, I just kind of would shut it down very quickly because I just felt so uncomfortable with the idea of considering right. that, you know, because some, you're asking me to consider like, well, what happens if this person passes away? You know, what does that mean? And it just, Feel, felt like this bizarre, unpleasant kind of inappropriate thing to do, thought to put into the world karmically, you know? Um, that being said, I can tell you, I can tell you shooting, um, not, you know, no spoilers, but there was, you know, shooting a couple particular scenes in the film um, with Cloris were so intimate and, you know, there was this, you know, sort of weird, you know, sort of magic feeling of it, you know, that was very strange, this, you know, crazy amount of intimacy. Um, so I don't know, I, I, you know, I don't know if that answers your question. I, I, I can't say that I, like I said, I, any, any thought that this might be her last movie was never something I, and it wasn't actually her last movie. It was her last starring role. You know, right. she, did, she did shoot other stuff after this, just to be clear. And, you okay. know, so, um, but it has been framed that way because it's her last, you know, kind of starring role. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, that's kind of my answer there. I, it, you know, it came oh, up. I, I, I didn't cool. entertain it. Um, but we did have a wonderful time with her. Like it was like it was a magical experience working with her really, honestly, truly. And I like that's not, you know, that's not just kind of, you know, PR speak. That is that is true. We had a wonderful time shooting this film. Um, they extended their say three times after we wrapped them twice in the County, once in Toronto. Um, we really connected with them personally. We've stayed in touch with Dinah, her daughter. Um, you know, it's, it was, it was, uh, and, and she just, you know, it was such an act of generosity for her to do this film for all the people who worked on it, you know, to have this, you know, legend give herself so fully and completely to this small little production in Canada, you know? Well, and you're absolutely right, because I mean, it is a it, it's it's a beautiful piece of art. And it's this really collaborative, emotional experience that people are going to get to watch. And I mean, I, I, I absolutely see your perspective. You don't want to see one of these people that you work with think of, you don't want to think of them as a line item. This is a part of your family and you lost part of that family. But I think this is really a beautiful celebration and ode to that and I, I can't wait for more people to get to see this film and i just want to say congratulations again and thanks for the time today man this was fun thank you very much and thank you for the kind words i really really appreciate it and don't forget to to visit our friends over at bay street video for all your dvd blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well over at 1172 bay street toronto ontario canada you can give them a call at 416-964-9088 that's 416-964-9088 or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your dvd and blu-ray needs